It is. It is. <laughs> I think one would be. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Alan is uh, on. Uh, he's on mute like right now. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Okay. 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 Oh, actually, it's it's all fine now. So, yeah. I was just wondering how to start the application, but this is all done remotely. So, well, thanks anyway. Okay. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming, all four of you, uh, to the Radix meeting. Um, so this is Radex at ITF95, and um, if you want to be elsewhere, <laughs> well, hopefully you don't want to be elsewhere, please stay here, otherwise the room is really empty. <laughs> so I'm Stefan, this is Lionel, and um, this is the agenda for today. So uh, let's take a look at the agenda as published. Um, so we're going to spend the usual time on preliminaries. So let me first start with the uh, note takers in JavaScript. Is anybody willing to take notes? Okay, there's not three people in the room. I have I need volunteers for notes and jabber, so one person can go without. But please do volunteer for something. Notes, 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 notes. <laughs> okay, this means I'm looking at Jim <laughs> for the notes, maybe. <laughs> uh, okay, right. <laughs> so, would you care to take notes? So, could take take some notes, and we will complete if needed. Thank you. <laughs> okay, and then we also need a JavaScript, um, which is getting really hard. <laughs> Can you uh, yeah. get it to Jabber? Okay, so uh, Lionel will uh, monitor the Jabber room. Uh, which means we are almost operational. Um, so let me quickly flip back to the uh, node well, which you should all observe and have seen all over the week. So here we go. Hope you've seen it. Um, so we can uh, start right away. <clears throat> uh, the first um, thing we have to do is uh, still the agenda bashing. So. If you have any problems with the agenda or if something changed, please do speak up now. Right, okay, so uh, let's start with the document status then. Um, and actually, we've uh, come a long way here. Um, if you s take a look at this uh, Radex Drafts 103 slide, you will see that we have pretty much flushed our output queue. All the documents we had uh, almost done in the last ITFs are now pretty much uh, off and published which is very nice. Uh, the one thing we have in IST processing right now is the larger packets for radius over TCP. Um, that's uh, Sam Hartman's work. Sam has published a uh, 05 version on 20, uh, 2015 December. Um, we have now gone through the ITF last call. We did get a couple of comments and the uh, verdict was uh, revised ID is needed. And uh, Sam promised to work on this, uh, what he said this week, but anytime soon is, uh, is pretty okay. Um, I don't think there are any major things in the document uh, that need much discussion, but um, well, this should really work in progress nicely. So the uh, slide Radex drafts two or three, this is now where our actual work is happening. Uh, we have the uh, radius extensions for IP port configuration and reporting from Dean Cheng. So actually Lionel um, wrote the Shepard write-up already, but he had some questions about it. Um, in the process of these questions, uh, many new versions of the drafts were published, and we're now at version 09, published on 2016 uh, in March 18. Um, not spending much more time on this because there is a slide deck on the open issues on this draft, so we can uh, see that in a couple of seconds. 
The other thing we are waiting for in, in the write-up uh, is uh, data types in uh, radius, uh, the work from Alan de Kock. Actually, the uh, Shepard write-up is on me, so um, I'm the source of, of all delay here. The thing is, I'm writing this right now, and I'm hoping to finish it in the flight when I get back. Um, one question uh, I had when I read the document is, this was a lot of legwork, uh, and there is this table with approximately 200 or something attributes uh, in the documents, uh, all of which are getting now a data type where they didn't have one before. And one question I would probably have to treat in the write-up is, um, did all these attributes, did all this work uh, get enough eyeballs on it? I mean, it's Alan's work, and I'm sure he drank uh, tons of coffee while writing it and, and, and doing a really thorough job, but errors might have happened. And I wonder if all these uh, attributes actually got a second pair of eyes checking through it. Um, would be sad if not, but well, we'll have to see about that. Uh, the action on that one is, uh, of course, for me to complete the write-up, and then at some point we can advance this to ITF last call. We also have uh, two documents which are currently uh, in progress working items, uh, one of which is the dynamic authorization proxying in remote well, in radios. Um, also, Alan de Kock's work together with uh, Uni Kohonen. Uh, the last draft is submitted uh, on 2016, January 11. Uh, again, we have a slide deck on that to discuss the remaining open issues there. And then we have my draft on considera considerations regarding the correct use of ePRESPONSE response identity, uh, which triggered a fair amount of discussion on the mailing list, which I didn't expect at this stage, but never mind. That was fun. <laughs> So uh, this was the initial draft uh, submitted on uh, 2016, March 21. Um, actually, meanwhile, thanks to all this lively discussion, I have lots of homework to complete for an one ribbon. Uh, and I do have a slide deck which tries to summarize all those things uh, we've been talking about. Lastly, we have uh, one piece of new work which is not currently on our stack, but might become, um, which is the radius extensions for network assisted multipath TCP, um, which is from Mehmet Bukader and, uh, and colleagues. Uh, actually, we have a second uh, version of that. The 01 was submitted uh, January 19, 2016. And um, the authors have a slide deck on it. I hope somebody is going to present. Doesn't really look like it. Um, well, anyway, um, what we also have roughly on our radar is uh, some people who submitted drafts um, with the Radex working group name in them, uh, some of which we talked about earlier, but we haven't heard from them in a while. Uh, so there's draft Clamor reset, Radex very common VSAs, and draft Erevind Radex message bundling. Um, these two have seen a bit of discussion. There was no real consensus to take them into the working group. So um, I'm prepared to just drop them off the radar unless somebody really thinks this needs discussion still. I also noticed that the data tracker has one other new draft, which I haven't heard anything about, but it, just, it sits there, uh, which is called draft one Radex multicast radius extensions. Uh, so it's an active ID. Somebody published that with the intent of coming to Radex, but I haven't heard anything. So um, yeah, if somebody wants to talk about it, it would be nice to raise discussion points on, on the mailing list. <laughs> yeah, and that's pretty much uh, all I see on our radar at this point. So um, I would immediately like to uh, continue with the uh, slide decks we had. So the first one would be uh, the IP port radius extensions. Um, question is, is there somebody here and able to present on them? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, and <clears throat> here we go. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, this is an update of this um, of the draft that has been. Yeah, so next slide, please. Yeah, so just as a reminder, this uh, this draft has passed the working group last call since uh, last year. So we did for a Chafford um, review that has been um, come there recently. So we have, we um, integrated the comment that we received from Lionel. Uh, uh, again, me thanks for a detailed review. Yes, it's very uh, very appreciated. 
so we have integrated all the comments that, have, that has been raised during that review and also some of editorial comments that has been raised also from, um, from Alan. Uh, but still we have one issue there that is um, displayed in the next slide. It's about the ANA section. In fact, we have um, the current approach in the draft. We all the attributes, all the TLVs have the same the same name and the same the, the same um, the same ID. Um, but Lionel has raised a point is that he thinks that it is more um, straightforward to um, to um, to define dedicated registry for the nested attributes, so that you that these attributes, even if they have the same name, the um, the have uh, identifiers will depend on, on on the parent attributes. So. As authors of this draft don't have any, um, you know, we will follow the recommendation from the working group. But um, despite there is no recommendation in existing the, the RFC to how to proceed with this issue, so uh, it's we um, uh, we are happy either to maintain the one which is which is currently in the draft or to go with the proposal from from UNL. So feedback is more welcome on this, so that we can fix this soon and shift the the draft. Um, um, hopefully, in, in uh, after this uh, this meeting. Yeah, it's <coughs> yeah, it's uh, Lionel. Um, yeah, the point is that um, as it was defined and how the registry is maintained or meant to be maintained. I think it's just about codes. It's not about name. So at least I'm just repeating my my comment. But I think it would be it would be um, easier because the main point was the extensibility and to be able to create any number of new attributes using a speaks name, whereas you are using the same sub attribute in different parent attribute will restrict the number of possible values. So it's why I was proposing to just follow the recommendation of the of the um, of the RFC defining the use of the extended AVP attributes, and to and to just have a unique identifier that will comply with uh, so that will be um, relevant only for parent attributes. So it would mean that the name need to because we need to have a, a unique name. Uh, we you will have one name. Pair parents, actually. So it, it is a proposal. I think it's otherwise, if you are using the same names, whatever the number of parent attributes that will use these attributes, you will you will um, reserve unnecessary uh, a number of values that would could be allocated pair parent attributes. So it, it's why I would propose that. After that, it's a discussion. So. I don't know if Alan is saying something, but my, my recommendation would be in this direction. Now, except if someone has a strong opinion against, I think it would be better. And it would be clear also because it is the first time that we need to use sub attributes in multiple parent attributes, yeah, yeah. but it may come uh, with the next draft. Yeah. We need to have a clear guidelines. Yeah, so just for the record, uh, uh, Alan is not in the queue. No. Alan? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, how do I get in the queue? Uh, just go ahead. Never mind. I was just surprised not oh, to okay. see you in the queue. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see a queue button here. Anyways, um, uh, uh, I'll say there's no for names, um, but uh, we we have to do something. It's it's the first time we're we're using multiple TLVs in multiple places. I don't really have a good solution here other than do something that makes sense that, that doesn't shoot ourselves in the foot. Well, I wonder in how far we are shooting ourselves in the foot with any of the two suggestions. It's just uh, allocating a different set of integers for the same things. I don't see any interrupt problems, no matter which approach we choose. Uh, it's mostly a beauty contest. Uh, so anyway, I don't have many stakes yeah. in here. So and that's also our take. And in fact, the current approach in the draft is more simple from the A and uh, standpoint. There is no 
dedicated registry for each of the, the attributes that we are defining in the in the draft. So I think it's more it's more simple. But I understand also the one the, the proposal that has been made by, by Lionel. But please give us one direction so so that we, we can speed up. So I think that's we we have it's one year that we are we are waiting so for a go for the, for this draft. I think that's yeah. If, if it's yeah, my, my, my point was just actually looking at the IANA and the, how the registry is maintained. So the recurrence for the IANA is simple when you have one single name. Exactly. But the consequences on the registry is more complex because um, when you are declaring the, uh, in the registry, when you are declaring um, this attribute and the sub attributes, mm -hmm. you need to, to define, uh, to allocate an, uh, an ID in the registry itself. Yes. But so. It, but if you want to say that this value will be unique, whatever the parent attribute, you will need to declare for all the existing or next uh, uh, parent attributes that this value can only be used. Um, this name will be used whatever the parent attributes. And there is no way to declare that in the registry. Yes, this is part of the specification itself in which you will you specify this kind of yeah, behavior. But, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. So we are wondering here about whether or not IANA can handle the complexity. So um, maybe one way forward would be to actually, actually ask IANA, um, do you mind if we do that? Can you handle that complexity? I, I, I do think it's, it's, it's a recommendation from this working to decide because this is, this, is, this is the first time you, I think that you have this kind of, of, of issues to, to, to process. It would be good if you, uh, you know, just for the next draft that we can, you will have the main issue so that yeah, there will be a guideline, so to say that, uh, uh, so that we don't have this kind of discussion again in the, in the, in the future. So the proposal, I, uh, unless if you, Lionel um, had an objection, I, I suggest that we, we go for the current option that we have in the draft. And during the discussion with Ayana, we can, uh, you know, once the draft has passed, will pass the issue review, we can, we can, we, we can re -ask, uh, ask again this, this question if this was for you. Hmm? We, we, we can go in this direction. Okay, that's, that, that will be, um, uh, be cool. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this means for the Shepard write-up probably that you should put an extra note. Ayana should carefully look at this particular aspect and uh, tell us if they can handle it or if they want this changed. But, but it, it is something anyway that we'll need to clarify because it cannot be left uh, for, for instance, it will be in the report of this meeting, but we should have something clear because how it is defined in the RFC, it is said that it is only relevant per parent attributes. So we need to make clear that if it is not the case, at least to put an errata or something uh, that could be used by anyone after that because we don't have to, 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 to figure out each time how to do that for, for, the next, um, for the next draft. Yeah, I think it's clear that whatever we come up with now is the way to go for all future drafts, yeah. Okay, anything else? Okay. If not, <clears throat> then uh, the uh, next discussion would be about a CUA proxy for which we have allocated 10 minutes. And since Ellen is with us, I guess we can just start right away. All right, <clears throat> let's see if we can put the uh, slides up. Um, not a whole lot new to add here. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So it's the, 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 the real open issue here is the ability to spoof the replies coming back. So when you send packets from a visited network to a home network, that's pretty straightforward. That works in ratings. It's, it's hard to spoof because there's the authentication credentials in that packet and you can't spoof a, a user's password. The packet's coming back the other way. Any of the authentication data, like state credentials, is visible to all of the proxies. And, um, um, that means that all the proxies can spoof it. So you can minimize it, but not prevent it. In addition to that, um, 3576 and 5176 were written assuming that proxying is possible, but not really talking about it. 
and that all the NAS treated all the attributes as mandatory. The problem is, as you start adding uh, attributes which are specific to proxying, you have to be sure that the local radius server removes all those attributes before it sends them back to the end. This is something that's happened in the real world where um, uh, I've seen people do this. If the NAS receives the proxy state, then it generates an error saying unsupported attribute. Even though 5176 says you are required to add a proxy state. Um, so that needs to be added with a bit of future text of hey, any attribute that gets added going outbound has to be removed coming inbound before it goes back to the man. Um, and then Peter Deacon has some comments which I would like further clarification on. And I think that's it for these points. Next slide. Yeah, so this just, just talks about what I was saying earlier. So I don't really have much to say else. I think that's it here for uh, on this one. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, this is, this is all just the additional explanation. So if we just skip through the slides, I think there's no real uh, new content other than that. So one question from my side is you uh, suggested two alternatives for the text here. I can get back here. Um, the second one says all server attributes and you put it in quotes here. Um, I think that from the wording here, uh, this should need some clarification because what is a server attribute? It's kind of undefined technology at this point. Uh, so I'm not totally happy with that formulation, but the first one actually uh, is nice to me. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the first one is, is simpler. Um, the second one is less server attributes than signaling attributes, which are perhaps. Um, basically, it's just sort of a, a different statement of, of the first one. But it must versus must. We can rephrase the first one to say a COA proxy must add attributes. Sorry, add the, the, the issue is when you do proxy, a radius proxy must add certain attributes when it sends it to The related COA proxy is just the way you do those attributes before it sends it to the So if you assume that a radius proxy and a COA proxy they each know what the other has. You have to ensure that you're not inserting stuff into the strain um, in one direction, you're not in the other direction. That makes sense. So it's a little hard to talk. There's some delay in the open, which makes it very difficult. So yeah, so what we have in the first one is a uh, well-defined whitelist because you can ex exactly observe what the uh, client was sending before or what the NAS was sending before. And the second one is a not quite so well-defined blacklist covering all sorts of things. And um, enumerating those is probably hard. Uh, yeah. But anyway. That's Jim Shard coming to the mic. Mac. Uh, Jim Shard. So in reading these two things, I know what the first one says. The second one bothers me from a lot of respects, including trying to decide how I know I'm a final proxy and trying to figure out what I'm supposed to remove and that just, it just doesn't fill me with warm, glowing feelings. 
Sure. So I'll, I'll update the document to uh, um, use the first version and uh, try and add a bit of explanatory, sorry, explanatory text around it um, to explain why it's necessary. Okay. <clears throat> so any other discussion points on the draft? Wonderful. Then the uh, next topic would be uh, the uh, populating ep identity. And I've allocated five minutes for it, but since I'm the chair, I can immediately adjust this. I guess it takes a few seconds more than that uh, due to the uh, amount of discussion we had. So could you advance the slides? Yeah. So uh, this is about the uh, populating your identity, and it is the thing that's uh, clogged up the mailing list in the last couple of days. Um, so this was finally accepted as a working group item. And um, the uh, changes in the meantime were that uh, this is now going on the BCP track. Um, there is a terminology section uh, in which I made up some identifiers, but uh, my choice maybe was not the best. So uh, we uh, actually discussed this on the mailing list quite a bit. The important thing about this is that uh, we very much converged that we only care about the one identifier that is transported inside EAP response identity. And we don't care about anything that is happening inside the EAP method. And that should be a, gui a guidance for all following discussions uh, because we're in no way trying to interfere with EAP methods as they are deployed. Well, the basic advice of the document is uh, still unchanged from the times of my uh, individual draft. So. Um, you can do on the supplicant whatever you like. You can use encodings uh, wherever you find them. Um, the thing is, as soon as you actually choose to put a string on the wire inside the response identity, make sure it is UTF-8 at that point. For the supplicant, this means he has to maintain state. If he stored all these strings in its local config and the local config was using ebc dic or something else, uh, that's all fine. But uh, as it goes out to the wire, it has to be UTF-8. The second point, which is probably a bit more uh, worthy of discussion, as we as I've learned in the last days, um, if there is a pool of more than one EAP method and more than one realm identifier as a consequence, you can choose from those. Um, it may be that one EAP session is not enough to get a successful authentication. So the one you chose may just not have worked. And then there is a second, maybe third, fourth alternative, and you should try these out if the first one failed. And this means you have to run an entirely new EAP conversation. So this is not about EAP chaining in any way. So this is not trying to keep the EAP session alive. These are several distinct EAP sessions um, until one of those uh, plentiful identifiers you have actually succeeds. Next slide, please. So we've had lots of discussion on the mailing list, um, much of which actually um, led to pending changes in the draft. Um, I was creating these slide decks a few days ago with many more red to be discussed uh, points, but actually I think in terms of what goes into the draft, most of the text is now actually converged and solved. So uh, one point was that I was using these inner and outer identity notions, which many EAP methods actually use, um, but maybe it is better in, indeed to, to invent some new terminology to steer clear of all kinds of misunderstandings uh, in terms of which a method meant what as an identity. So the thing is that we now have user identifiers and realm identifiers, and um, these are the things I will use in the next revision of the document. Then the other point was, can we actually uh, tell RFC 3748 that everything has to be UTF-8 at this point? It's arguably slightly beyond our mandate because uh, we are only supposed to care about EAP if it is transported over a triple A transport, but uh, most of the time it is, and actually Bernard Agoba um, said it would be better if somebody actually made that global statement and said, okay, EAP response identity is always under all circumstances uh, UTF-8 
or you're doing something wrong. So um, we, we can have an updates relationship to 3748, and we can just write it in there, and that should be it. Local encodings of identifiers, again, what I said before holds true. So uh, there are no restrictions on what happens in the supplicant. So uh, we're talking Las Vegas, what happens in the supplicant stays in the supplicant. Um, but as soon as you communicate with the outside world, do use UTF-8, and uh, that's it. Then we had an interesting discussion about uh, what is the relationship between the realm identifier and the user identifier. And um, one point is there are situations where you can't do with one realm identifier. You could have multiple EAP methods, and they have multiple different identifiers in the EAP methods. And there has to be some kind of link between what is inside the EAP method and what is sent as EAP response identity. This does not mean they have to be identical. They can be totally different strings. They can be totally different encodings. But there is a dependency in the way that if you have chosen an EAP method, then you also have to choose one of the uh, realm identifiers, which makes sure that your request actually terminates at a server, which can handle whatever comes inside that EAP method. Um, in the early days of the draft, I always said, well, this means that the realm identifier is specific to the EAP method, and that makes it a method-specific identifier, and that raised all kinds of concerns. So forget about that. We just say uh, there is a dependency of some sorts. It might be that, let's say you have five EAP methods, and uh, two of those actually can be catered for with the same, same realm identifier, lucky you. So there is not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, could be less realm identifiers. Then there are EAP methods on the system, uh, but you don't know that. OK. Um, yeah, the uh, logic in terms of selecting uh, the uh, realm identifier is first you select an EAP method with which you want to authenticate with. Then you look up which of the realm identifiers is suitable for using the EAP response identity there. And then you send that realm identifier in EAP response identity. In terms of the user identifier, uh, that was probably the most controversial point at, at this point. Uh, so if somebody were to create a new EAP method, probably it would be a good idea if that person uh, used NAI identifiers for its uh, user identifiers. Um, but if that is for some reason not possible, and also especially for existing EAP methods, um, we're not suggesting any changes to the deployed reality out there. So this is only uh, advice for the future. If you happen to design a new EAP method, uh, it would be better if you use an AI. And finally, the last issue, uh, the realm identifiers. Um, what about the local parts? And what about the uh, structure we want to impose on those? Um, one point which came out of this is that uh, what the NAI document suggests is that the local part should be empty. And um, there is this backward compatibility for anonymous, and this is just this one string, which is suggested um, if you think you need it, uh, if you cannot do with the, with the empty local part. And then the second thing is that um, we really want to see NAIs uh, on the internet in the response identity, uh, so you can have uh, good routing rules. Um, it's maybe too much to ask it for everybody on the planet, even inside enterprises, because inside an enterprise, you don't have to care about what the rest of the world does. Uh, but the suggestion was it must be in an AI if you want to interact with the outside world in any way. And it should be in an AI if you are in a closed world, just in case you might at one point decide you want to leave your closed world. But if you really want to stick with some local identifier, which is not in an AI, uh, there is no way to stop you anyway. Yeah, the last thing that we didn't touch on the mailing list yet, uh, I guess we'd have to at some point. Um, I remembered Honolulu, and uh, there was this point discussed in the meeting that when we talk UTF-8, we may also want to talk about normalization. Actually, I don't. Uh, but um, the idea there was that we should follow the NAI document and say, OK, if an EAP here thinks it would also want to normalize the string before putting it in EAP response identity, then it can do that. Um, nobody else. Uh, should try to fiddle with it while it is in flight on the way to the server. I think that's 
with a good sane suggestion and uh, I will put that in the document. I simply forgot about that. So yeah, actually we have converged on most of these issues. Uh, I will write a new ref. Um, just maybe th th this one word of, uh, <laughs> of extra discussion here. Um, if you followed the most recent exchanges uh, with Bernard and, and Alan, um, the, the question was really nothing about the wording of the draft itself, but about the use case. Is it in any way normal or can it be expected that you have more than one EAP method to use for a single network? And um, that was pretty exotic until recently because if you configured your supplicant, let's say for, for a Wi-Fi enterprise network, um, the config in your supplicant typically asks you, so which EAP method do you want to use for this SSID? And that's it. So there is a one-to-one -one relationship between SSID uh, and the EAP method. Unfortunately, the world is getting, getting more complex and um, I'm not sure if everybody actually uh, has realized that or actually cares enough about this world. So uh, there is the IEEE 802.11 interworking chapter, which basically uh, has as a as an underlying theme, uh, the SSID is a single string and it's burnt and it's not good enough to select a network. We devise completely new ways of um, for a network to show which kind of identifiers it supports. One of those is that the uh, Wi-Fi beacon can say, hey, if you have a uh, cellular SIM card and it is from the operator <coughs> MCC123 and uh, MNC45, uh, then you can log into this network. Never mind the SSID, we don't care about the SSID. And there are other things like uh, roaming consortium identifiers with the same idea. So um, if you've configured the clients uh, to know that you have a credential which is uh, valid for a roaming consortium and the Wi-Fi access point emits, I support logins for people with an account at this roaming consortium, then the SSID is just not relevant anymore. And the consequences of that is you might have, may have a conf configuration on your device which says, if I come to the SSID at your own, I use one credential. Um, if I come to networks which support my SIM card, I will use my SIM card. And then the unpleasant part is when the uh, Wi-Fi network actually uh, has in its beacon, my SSID is at your home, and you can also connect with your SIM card. And all of a sudden, with these multiple independent ways of finding out how I can authenticate to the network, uh, the supplicant is stranded with a choice of EAP methods. And they're totally independent, and there is really no, no easy way to choose. And it might be that one of those doesn't work, and the advice in the document here is then simply that if you have a choice and your first choice didn't work and didn't authenticate you to the network, maybe you just want to run a second EAP session and try this other way of connecting to the network. That's all. Um, I don't think I can, can do much in terms of text in the draft. The text just says, if you have multiple opportunities to use, um, be sure to iterate through all of them. Um, but I think adding this, uh, this use case of a Wi-Fi network with these multiple network selection identifiers. I hope it gets things a bit more clearer and, uh, well, helps to uh, converge in the discussion on that point. And that's it. Okay. At least, <coughs> at least let's, uh, I have to, 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 to check, but I think that there is at least the, the, the case of uh, multiple EP mates for the same user and the same network may, may be supported in 3GPP, especially when they have introduced EAP EKA and after that EAP EKA prime. Mm -hmm. So the way, and, and the user don't even know what is supported by the AAA server. So uh, the way to, to, to do it right now is to use a specific identifier with a um, um, prefix uh, like a zero or six, depending on if it is EKA or Okay, prime. But at least uh, it is having a user over the same Wi-Fi access supporting multiple EAP methods is something relevant. Well, I think I think I don't know enough about 3GPP, but at least you have the lucky case that the realm identifier for both EAP methods would be the same because it would still be at uh, 3GPPnetwork.org. So both EAP methods probably terminate at the same server, and then EAP method negotiation can can kick in and. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, it's using the prefix anyway. You you are able to use the uh, the IMSI, but I was more speaking about the uh, access network issues, saying that you have multiple UEs and so on. But it is something uh, at least the use case exists. Okay, so I'm pretty sure we should keep the text in the draft yeah. um, for this extra piece of advice. Actually, I have a war story about why I actually wrote the text that was years ago before interworking was there. That was an implementation problem of one supplicant vendor, but I don't think it matters anymore. The uh, Interworking thing is the much better reason. So n n now I have a specific question because I have not been through all the uh, the, the the email exchange uh, recently on, uh, on 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 the definition of the identity or identifier. Uh, so f first of all, is uh, Bernard okay with the last? Um, so what is the last uh, status on that? When you said solves, it means that uh, Bernard is okay with what was said, or uh, when I say Bernard, it's Bernard Ab uh, Abuba. Yeah, I think he, he is, but he would have to confirm himself. Uh, you know, the real problem is that I, I, I use the term method-specific identity for the realm identifier, which goes in the if response, um, because it is kind of specific to the method, but it is not the reserved term method-specific identity. And uh, that, that was just a source of much confusion. And, and a question from my side is, what is the real, um, so the realm identifier? So, where where is it used exactly? Well, it is used to be put in the EAP response identity. It is not used inside the EAP method. The response, okay. And it is something already done, actually. You receive something like at orange.com or... Yeah, it's pretty common deployed practice. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, at that point, we are nearing the last presentation of today, and that is the multipoint TCP. Yeah, so, yeah, this will be, uh, this will be quick, so, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, this is a proposal, yeah, to, to, um, to specify a new attribute for uh, in order to provision the uh, MPTCP constant writer to, um, to, uh, to SCP. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this slide is just providing you the context of this, of this, uh, of this work, why we, are, why we are trying to define, uh, why we are trying to provision um, this information to, uh, to, to the CP. The overall context is that the current trends for, by, made by, by, by operator is that because of, um, of the obsolescence of some network access technologies, they are, there is a need to uh, provide a more enhanced quality of experience to customers. But the problem is that for, in some of the segments and some of the customers, we cannot always upgrade the access technology to provide more bandwidth and more capacity to the customers. So the, 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 the strategy for, for some of, of, this, um, of, 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 um, of our network segments is to aggregate multiple um, access networks uh, so that we provide an enhanced quality of service to the customers. So one of, of, of the solutions that, that is currently integrated in our project is, is called MPTCP, and this protocol is meant to aggregate various connections that are sent over various um, um, access networks um, and uh, present them as one single connection to, uh, to, to, to the customer. So this is for better quality of experience and better, um, better um, um, including service continuity and also the incre increased um, increased bandwidth for, for, for its customer. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, MPTCP in, in, in principle it is um, an end-to-end -end protocol which allows to, to signal um, in TCP, se in in TCP se uh, session themselves the information so that you can uh, tell the other endpoints that here are all the set of my IP addresses and my set of port numbers so that you can establish multiple connections, and then you can glue all these connections so that it can be perceived as one single connection. But the problem is that for the service providers that we don't control the, net, the terminals and we, we don't control the servers. And today, the current rate of the penetration of, of MPTCP servers is that there are only few servers. So if you want to, uh, to, uh, to benefit from the, the functionality and the features that are, are provided by MPTCP, um, we, um, we are currently investigating the need to introduce in new features into the CPE it, itself and to introduce some 
uh, dedicated um, uh, service functions at the network, which we call the, the concentrator. So the overall, uh, the, the overall um, um, uh, uh, there will be three uh, TCP legs. The first one between the, the, ho the internal host and the CP, and the CP will translate, in fact, the TCP connection into a multi-path TCP connection. So the data will be split into um, a variable uh, network attachment. And then the concentrator will terminate the sessions and then translate them into, into um, a TCP connection. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, the, um, th this document is, is um, focusing on, on the provisioning part at the net network, net network side. Um, there, there will be multiple MPTCP uh, concentrator instances that will be um, uh, deployed in the network. Yeah, just one important aspect here is that we are not dealing with MPTCP in general for all the, con all the configura network configuration. We are dealing with one specific con configuration, which is we are controlling both network accesses. So there is no conflict between the configuration that will be coming from various networks because we are controlling both the mobile one and also the, the fixed the fix connection. Um, the MPTCP concentrator um, um, is, is stored in um, a AAA server. This is very important for us because we don't want to, uh, to introduce another authorization um, uh, phase uh, between the CPA itself and the concentrator, and we want to leverage on existing, on existing techniques during the network attachment at both for the fixed and for, for the mobile itself. So this document is about radius extensions and not uh, about MPTCP in general. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, t this slide just summarized the rationale that we and the, the, the design that we adopted in, in, this, in this draft. Is that to say that we are following closely the recommendation from this working group? So, all, um, especially uh, the ones which are in the data type um, uh, draft. Uh, we are also avo avoiding uh, polymorphic uh, attributes. So, we are defining two attributes one for IPv6 and one for IPv4. One. Uh, multiple instances of the, sa of the same uh, MPCP concentrator can be included in the, in the, in the, in the attribute. And uh, both maybe um, uh, IPv4 and IPv6 can be included in the same in the same message. Next slide, please. This is just uh, uh, there, there is not, nothing new there, nothing specific to uh, to, to, to the case. It's just to to, uh, to tell you how we can we are look, um, we are considering uh, including this 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 attribute in in the architecture. So it's it will be. Um, so the DHCP server or the NAS function will, will contact the server. Then we, it will, if the customer is, is, has subscribed to the server, we will, contact, we will convey to him the information about the MPTCP consent right for IPv4 or IPv6 uh, addresses that will be translated into a dedicated DHCP or DHCPv6 option so that the, the, the CP can use the, 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 the information that we uh, return to, to him. Next slide, please. So I think, yeah, we, we have already um, received um, um, uh, an interesting uh, review from Alan Nicol and we um, integrated all the comments that he, he raised. We, are, we still can, will come in all, all the comments that we can uh, receive from the working group and we would like to, uh, to progress this, um, this item uh, in, in, in Radex. Comment, question? Um, you know, so a uh, question for clarification first. Could you show this? Uh, yeah, on, on this one, it's um, so you need to send back MTCP, MPTCP information to the client, or yes, uh, okay, okay. This, this is done in dedicated option, the HCP, uh, the HCP option, okay. Because in, in the first one, I thought that the uh, CP, for instance, was. In, in, in this uh, diagram, the CP is who's a NAS? No, the, the DHCP the DHCP v6 client. Okay. So there is no, no modification at the CP. Okay, good. He's not aware about mm. about, about about the Redis exchanges. Okay, good. Mm. And uh, the second point was that is this uh, discussed somewhere else, or Sorry. is this um, proposal to have? No. Okay, it, so it is, it, is, it is only for right, um, uh, this working group because this is where Redis extensions are. Yeah. So okay. So the and uh, there is no need of other information no. than the IP address of the concentrator uh, for the M MPTCP stuff to work. You don't need so from a CP point of view, only the IP address will be re exactly. recurrent. Exactly. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So I also have a question about that same diagram. Mm. So it, I'm not sure where this information exchange that happens in the access acceptance uh, here is related to AAA. It looks like the, uh, the NAS realizes, oh, I would like to send a DHCP option, but I have no idea where the concentrators are. So it 
it does this request just to figure out something about the network topology. Uh, not only about the network topology, it's also the, um, to see whether this customer, the CP, is authorized to, to, uh, to use the MPTCP server service. This is just an example of the use of the, of, of, of the attribute. Uh, this is not the, perp the, the focus of the, of the draft, but this is just one example of how we, uh, we, we plan to use it. So this is not the core, uh, yeah. So when you deploy this MPTCP in the background thing, uh, you do that selectively for customers? Yeah, it, it means yes, some, of our, some, some of the affiliate, because in fact we have a, a big group, you have various de deployment contexts, and some, th this feature is not necessarily provided to all the customers. But this is this is not the okay. again this is not the purpose of the draft. Yeah. But no, but uh, it raises the question. So um, if there's if, if it's not related to authorization, then but, get your topology information from elsewhere. <laughs> you don't have to use radius for that then. Yeah. On, so it it was not a comment. It's more a question. But I don't know if you have the answer. But do you need something specific in the request to indicate that you want to receive MTCP uh, address or not? MTC, uh, MPTCP concentrator address or not? Or is it something that will be up to the AAA server to send back this information depending on your policy? Yeah. yeah. So it will be up to the AAA server to know that for this client, exactly. I need to send, so it will be part of the configuration, uh, exactly. okay, yeah. to yeah. the user profile. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have plenty of questions about multipath multi TCP uh, <laughs> in general yes. because I don't know how a end user device establishes a single TCP connection to its CPE and that magically gets yeah. spread yeah, out. Yeah, there's a proxy. That's there's in fact a proxy that will translate the TCP. Uh, MPTCP is just an option, a TCP mm -hmm. option that you inject in fact during in, in the same exchange and mm -hmm. we call that MPTCP because just you uh, you you, you uh, you can create multiple subflows that are bound to the same TCP connection. So you terminate the TCP connection at the CPE. The mm. CP connection does its own stuff, gets the data, and sends mm. the single TCP back. This is this is one implementation option. Is this actually <laughs> IETF technology, RFCs, and all this? Uh, MPTCP, yes. But this is RFC there. Hmm? But also the, the termination at the CPE. The termination at the CPE is not. There is no RFC for this one now. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, it's not the core topic anyway, so exactly. I will read up on it a bit, but yeah, yeah. it reads strange, mm. or it looks strange. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything else? Uh, I, I will review the document. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll be glad if, you, if, if, we, um, if you can consider adding an, um, an item in the charter for this, for this, for this document, so that will, be, uh, that will be really cool. Thank you. I, I, I think that the the discussion, but you, you, I think that the discussion at the end, because it is under the same, in the same administ uh, administration, it's I think to consider if it needs to be a standard attributes or it could be relying on vendor specific attributes. I, I have no, I have no, I have not checked already the draft, but because the assumption today is to say that it is under the same, um, inside the same. Um, so it would be managed by one single administrator, right? The, the, yeah, this, this is the activation of the MPTCP itself. That means that this information about the reachability of your concentrator, you will receive that through networks that are managed by the same entity, which means that there won't be any conflict between provision information that we receive from various network attachments. This is why it, this is important. Okay. By the point about communicating between a NAS and, and the AAA server, you, um, you, you, you need the standard there so that you Otherwise, you will have some interoperability issues because this, this may be provided by, by different vendors. Your NAS and your AAA servers are does not necessarily. From from a AAA server, it's okay. I think the only point to consider will be from the CP point of view. Uh, the, the CP the CP is is not aware about the Redis exchange. He's only what it needs is to receive information through DHCP or DHCPv6 or uh, TR69 or whatever means you are using to configure your 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 CP. So the interoperability issues is, is something which is, again, this is not, the, uh, for instance, if you take the, the Radish extension to, to, uh, to configure the DSLite e, uh, CGN, for instance, it's exactly the same thing that you, 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 are, you we are doing here. Yeah, my, 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 so my comment was wrong, but it was about the NAS. Exactly. Okay.
Okay, so I will also review this document anyway. Um, so I think we're pretty much done, and um, the only thing is still pending kind of a un undone homework is uh, that people here wanted to advance RFC 6614, radios over TLS, to stand its track, and that's nice. Um, the thing is, we would need somebody to actually edit the documents slightly. At some point, Sam Hartman said, if nobody else does it, I'll do it, but Sam has moved on from the ITF at some point. And uh, he may not have the time for that, so the document still lingers around. And um, when we do update it, we should also be wary of uh, TLS changes. Uh, Joe Salloway told me that there is a zero RTT mode, and the question would be, could there be some replay attacks where you just uh, send an accounting packet inside radios over TLS twice, just because you, because you can replay it with zero RTT modes. Sounded daunting, but I don't know enough details. <laughs> Uh, Jim Shedd, I'm more than willing to do the authoring on the TLS draft. Wonderful, thanks. So um, that was the only point I had. So this is kind of an open mic for 30 seconds or something. Uh, if you have anything generic about the working group you want to talk about, please talk about it now. All right. Yes, I'm here. Thank okay. You. That means we um, still have time for one working group business. The uh, so I guess we are um, officially joined as Radius Working Group, uh, but we still so have uh, Alan on the line, um, uh, and he has a little proof of concept um, for uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, and um, so let's just let Alan present on this topic. Uh, and if somebody has to go, like the chair, because I think yeah, they have some fights at some so point, I will go. Gone. to the <laughs> next slide, if one of the chairs is still there. Alan? There we are. It's not just Pete. Pretty much everything is broken from that um, point of view. Any insecure internet that can't be made secure by using TLS. You can't just say add on the set. Suddenly everything works. Um, for recent versions of polling systems, it's possible for the server to request GTLS GTC or PAP and get the clear text password. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So this is the, the, the failure of the test. The only real method of identifying the wireless network is the SSID which can be said and is not authentication. The only method of identifying the EAP server is via the presented certificate. And everyone knows to click on those. Um, we can't trust the user to do the right thing, so we need administrator intervention. Um, next slide. So this is what iOS does. Um, I'll skip over that. The, the, the slides are up on the, the agendas. So I won't bother reading all that. Um, there's no option available to configure the software to iOS, which is a bit better. So if you go to the next slide. Here's what Windows 10 does. Um, curiously, you can't see the, the certificate CN or issuer. Um, only the fingerprint, which is a bit odd, but um, it's what they've done. Anyways, next slide. So as it turns out, um, you can generate a pretty convincing fake certificate on the fly by using the corporate website. So the supplicant sends an email identity, or just at example.com, you can get your radio server to connect to example.com, close the field, um, or connect to the corporate Wi-Fi if you're close enough. Um, it creates a new radio server certificate, presents it to the user. All the fields are correct, and it may be signed by someone like VeriSign that people actually care about the difference between any and them. Seems to be a valid certificate, and the user clicks that. Oh, next slide. So what this means, pretty much anyone who's capable of configuring an access point server or using an password can pretty much the modern devices. Only the first time they did someone know that it was in a new SSID. Um, this is something that I built. It works, it's a whole lot of fun. 
Normal SSID games can be spoofed in order to get users to sign up again. So if you zero roam, for example, um, there's UCF SSIDs and internationalized holograph attacks. Um, Windows at least has something really here and shows you a whole collection of damage instead of um, the holograph attacks. And Windows assumes that the SSIDs are last um, it does not show you anything um, useful on the So the only way to work around for this is to disable all manual intervention and to rely on administrative configuration provided by security. Next slide. So how to fix it? Um, enterprises with required manual intervention, uh, administrative configuration is allowed manual configuration. Um, adopt standards, the supplicant vendors remove the users from the configuration. Um, you don't involve them in the HTTPS system to say, hey, this guy is uh, unknown. Um, that, that's all got to be removed. Um, it all has to be administrative config configuration. And for IETF and anyone else to find strong applications, um, probably also um, enterprises are out to do that. Uh, um, so Yeah, I mean, the, the purpose of this is not just to show people that it's possible, um, but to show that it's so, easy. So, thank you for that. And, um, Actually, also, thank you for this last link down there, uh, the uh, SENS um, report. So it's, <laughs> That's it's, actually it's something I wrote, and it's, it's a production of um, how we think supplicants get users like to sign up to an effort like that. So there's the guidelines about what to do in case of different things. And we don't really have a place for that for a wider audience because it's, it's UI considerations. Uh, it's not usually what the ITF cares about. Um, but I'd be happy if more people did that. <laughs> oh, I, I, I know. I mean, I, I went into the same kind of situation myself trying to connect to a, a new SSID where um, I know my credentials, I don't have the server certificate configured, and at least on Yeah, but recent, just to give you an idea uh, <clears throat> about Apple what's systems, uh, preventing uh, manual configuration as, as an impact. So in Edgerome, we are aware that even though user, we tell people to use administrative configuration and app validation, the question is, uh, you know, what at least 50% of people know how it works, like how it's up manually, and just run. how trivial so, it is uh, in real life, to get the user a seemingly balanced upset and gone. So people will actually pay attention to it rather than <laughs> Well, I'm open to suggestions. Well, okay, for at least for our group in Edgerome, I will discuss this in our development team and then see if we will actually put up that advice. Um, there are some some ways I can prevent that people 
use the ad hoc setup method, um, even if the OS allows it to happen. But as I said, it's quite drastic. So let's see how this works. But, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, maybe we can check also with uh, Stefan if there is something to, to Yeah, I'd be happy to work on that. Um, to make, yeah, the, the to make this publicly short, available yeah. and, uh, and provide at least some recommendations. So ETS. as you said, it should not be part of uh, IETF, but the implication of uh, relying on uh, EAP method and so on, and how to use this EAP method should be, I think, uh, Documented somewhere, so maybe we can see also with uh, with him if it could be uh, interesting to have some kind of uh, informational at least or BCP even uh, document describing uh, the issue and and the proposed way to fix this issue. At least we can we can we at least we can ask for and we will see what will be the answer. We will discuss that. So we will need to close the meeting now because we need to rush to the airports <laughs> and uh, for, for some of them, at least for the chairs. So thank you, Alan. Thank you, all of you, people still in the room and people that were in the room. And um, see you in Berlin. And uh, please uh, keep uh, be act uh, keep uh, being active on the mailing list, especially we are regarding the uh, existing documents that we need to, to push forward. Thank you. When is your flight? Um, 16.55, and the taxi is waiting outside oh, in two minutes. Oh, really? OK. <laughs> yeah. um, so you will be in Berlin? I will be in Berlin, yeah. You will be there, too?